So this is the fourth of four workshops today in track one for Nevada County Camera Club annual November workshop. And uh, so uh, this is Preparing Your Image for Display by David Wong, who's been very flexible. Thank you, David. A little technical issues in the previous one if you weren't with us. So we're starting just a few minutes late, but not bad. And so with that, uh, this will run till about 3.30 and that ends our workshop for today. And then this will be recorded as will track two and available on the club's website within a few days. So with that, I turn it over to David. All right, well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm gonna talk about preparing your images for display. And um, I, I think a lot of times when I talk about this, people go, oh, you know, I don't print my images. I don't show my images. I don't do any of that. Why should I, you know, pay attention to um, preparing my images for display? And um, there, I talk about steps and I talk about um, in, um, let me go to this one and this one. And you see here this, this, one page here. Um, and I talk about preparing images. And, and when, I, when I talk about, the, there are five steps I, that I think of in making a photograph. There's the story, there's the photographic uh, fundamentals of like the, the triangle uh, uh, of, you know, uh, aperture ISO and shutter. And then there's the, how you work your camera. And then there's the dark room or the digital dark room. And then there's this last step of, of uh, uh, making your, uh, getting your images ready for display. And people go, well, you know, I, I don't print. Why, why should I even care about this part? And um, the, the short of the long is I'll tell, um, and many of you have heard this before, but, um, Ansel Adams always said, um, let's see, let me go, you can see this. He said he considered, I don't know if you know, but he was a concert pianist before he was a photographer. And he said he, the, the negative is like the score of the music and the, the print is like the performance. So you have a, a long ways between reading a score of music as a negative and hearing it come out. So how you, uh, how you affect that um, negative uh, and, and for presentation really makes a huge difference. And the other thing I wanted to tell you is, of, you know, all the teachers that I've had, you know, you know, some of them are really high up there, you know, former assistants of Ansel and whatnot, Every single one of them prints. And because they print, they actually do more with the photo than most people do. And printing a photo isn't just a matter of, oh, I wanna print the photo, but printing the photo will make you a, a much, much better photographer than if you don't print a photo. And even if you don't print the photo, getting the photo ready for printing is, is what I'm, is, is equally as good. So with that, I'm gonna kick off and we're gonna talk about, uh, a lot of people ask about monitor calibration. Well, what is monitor calibration? All your monitors all look different. Every, everybody's monitors look different. And for those of you that have been to, when we had our in-person uh, uh, meetings, uh, at the, the church, uh, they go, well, you know, my photo didn't look like that. Yeah, I mean, in the way I did it, 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 it comes out differently. And a lot of the discussion centers around, well, is your monitor calibrated? Do you know that your colors look the way they should look? Uh, whether it's for projection or for print or any other medium. Um, so you should care about monitor calibration. And what is, it, what is it doing? It's just calibrating your monitor to a known standard. And then, um, 
So you'll use uh, a colorimeter for uh, that purpose. And a colorimeter, let's see, I'm gonna show you over here. Let's see, oh, I need to go, sorry. One of the things about, let me stop sharing there. And for, I don't know how many of you have have seen or know what a colorimeter is, but I'll show you. This is an, I don't know, can you see it there? Okay, this is an old yes. one. Mm -hmm. This is a color monkey. This is several years old now, and it still works for me. Uh, you can buy these colorimeters for as little as $170. And, and if you have never calibrated your monitor, you should. You, you can buy a, a colorimeter like this and it comes with the software and it's very easy to use. Or the club has, has one. And I don't know, let's see, is Dave, Arstein's not on right now, but the club does have one that, uh, and I believe you can borrow that one. Yeah, so that all you have to do is download the software and borrow the colorimeter and you can calibrate your monitor. You calibrate your monitor once and you know maybe once or twice a year because as things change, the monitor ages, different you know, colors you know, shift a little bit. And I'm, I'm not gonna show you how to do it, but all it is, all you're gonna do is you're gonna bring up the software and this device hangs on your monitor. And in the bottom of it, it reads, you'll see a bunch of patches that come up and the, the colorimeter reads these patches. And, it, and then it interprets these colors as standards and then decides, well, this red really looks like this. This cyan looks like this. And so you calibrate your monitor. You can also uh, calibrate your projectors your iPhones and your cell phones so that they have accurate color. You can also uh, do calibrate it and work with your printer. So now I have, from the time I look at my screen here and the colors on that to the time that it comes out on my printer, they're fairly close. Um, it's never gonna be exact, but that's how you do images so that when you send them somewhere, you know that they're gonna look right. Uh, so I suggest that you do that. Um, the, let's see, here is, yeah, I don't know. Is this too small? Like, can you read, can you see that? I can't it's, see it, no. no. It's, it's, it, it's, it's not the size, it's very white. It's hard to see it even. Yeah, yeah, because of the, the whiteness of the monitor. At any rate, this, this, the current X-Rite Display Studio Colorimeter is $169. And in, it'll last you for years. So if you haven't, uh, if you don't have one, you can borrow the clubs, but it probably would be worth your while to go ahead and get one, especially if you've ever been there and you go, well, that looked fine on the on the display, and then when I printed out, it didn't look right, or whatever. I would suggest that you you go and uh, and do that. Um, let's see. I'm gonna go back. Let's see here. See how well this works. Uh, now I'm going back to. Uh, did I? Am I back on? Yes, I am back on. All right. So that's the one, one of the things that you should do. Um, is that all you should do? No. Uh, I don't know how many of you know about ICC profiles. No. Yeah. Okay, ICC profiles is another thing that you do. So if you go and let's say you decide that you're gonna make this gorgeous print for the, uh, for the, um, uh, the fair, uh, the fairgrounds, and you, you want to print it on this beautiful Hanamule paper that you've seen, 
and it's just this really lush looking paper. Well, every single printer and paper combination are different in their, in their calibration. And so you, if you go to print on your Canon glossy paper or your Epson glossy paper, they'll look different. So you need a different ICC profile for every device you print it on. Now, what if you just go down to Costco and have your, have your, your prints done at Costco? Well, even if you have your prints done at Costco, Costco can give you an ICC profile. And what that is, is a, it's, a, uh, it's, it's a profile that you stick in your library on your computer so that when you go to, you say, oh, I'm gonna go down to bring these prints to Costco and I want them to look right, uh, then it will load up, you'll, you'll load up that profile, you'll make your adjustments and you take it down there. And by the time you've done that, now your prints are going to look somewhat accurate you know, versus taking a guess and doing a profile for a paper or something that, that Costco does not have. So uh, the ICC profiles are free. You can get them from the place where you have your prints done. You can get them from the paper manufacturers. If you use Epson papers or whatever, you can go to epson.com and you can find, you know, well, I use Epson um, uh, premium luster, whatever. So you'll look it up and I, and I print it on my Canon printer. Well, you'll look it up and it'll go, what printer do you have and what paper are you printing it on? And you'll load that up. And then when you work on your images, now they're going to be fairly color accurate. They're, they're never going to be 100%. But that's what you, you should do. Um, and with that, I'll tell you one funny story. Uh, I have a print teacher named Charlie Kramer. A number of you have taken classes from Charlie. He's probably the, the foremost print guru in the whole country. You know, a former associate of Ansel's and whatnot. And I asked Charlie, I said, Oh, what, how do you calibrate your monitor? And he told me he doesn't. <laughs> and I go, I've been pre I'm preaching all of this and you don't calibrate. He says, well, you know, the, a lot of the monitors are fairly good. And he goes, I print early and I print often. And so that's the, that's the mantra. You've got to print early because the, it's never going to be the same. You print early, you look at it, you get your prints, you, you look at what you've done. Oh, I like this, I don't like this. And he goes, he prints often. So there's, there, there you are. Uh, I would still calibrate my monitors though. Yeah, and get your ICC profile. Okay, the next thing I wanted to talk about is um, your environment. All right, you see, you see it here, uh, I have, um, I have three monitors between my laptop, the ViewSonic, and my BenQ monitor. And if you weren't uh, at the break, if you didn't hear, Rachel asked me, what is this uh, on the, this monitor on the right? What is this hood around it? And that's my BenQ monitor. And the BenQ higher end monitors come with a hood so that the light from the window and back doesn't shine on the, on the surface of my monitor. And why should you care? Well, guess what? You know, when you have light shining from another source on your monitor, it will throw off your vision and it will throw off your viewing and then your colors, even though you did all this fancy stuff with uh, you know, calibration and everything, it will throw it off. So I would encourage you, you, you know, if you don't get one of these monitors, you can make one out of foam core and just have it around there to, to block that extraneous light. I also have a, a viewing lamp that is a known uh, number of degrees Kelvin so that my viewing environment is always stable and is always the same. Um, that's another thing that I would encourage you to do. But guess what? There's more. If you look at 
uh, let's see. Okay, you see my my uh, my image here, and you see over my left shoulder, you see the the bright light. I have uh, a bulb in there that is a color accurate bulb, and your viewing uh, lighting makes a big difference on your prints because uh, you want to know that when you print it out, a lot, most people do their prints for the home or if they sell their prints, they sell it some, and people are putting the prints up in their home. Usually they're under incandescent lighting. So I have a light that's 3000 degrees Kelvin. 3000 degrees Kelvin is a, warm, is a warmer light. And uh, most people don't like to look at the, their photos with a colder light. It's more like daylight. They like a little warmth to it. So I look at my images under the same conditions that I expect the images to be shown at. And so by having that uh, light, which I get from a company called a thousandbulbs.com, they have all sorts of bulbs. And have, you, and have you ever wondered, well, how come I can't get a bright LED bulb of the right temperature? You go to thousandbulbs.com and they have a z more than a thousand bulbs. <laughs> so I would recommend them. They're, they seem to be pretty good. Uh, a good, that LED light, is very, as you can see, is very bright. That was about a $25 bulb but it's supposed to last, you know, a, a many, many thousands of hours. So that I would recommend as another thing that you do in preparing your images. The other thing that that's really good for is um, most of us, and I'm just as guilty as everybody, we take a photo, and we put it up on our monitor and we make our adjustments and we go, oh, all right, done. All right, how many of you have taken that photo, you're done and you go print it out and you go, oh, I don't like this. I didn't notice this little you know, bright area in the back of it that draws my eye away. Well, what a lot of, my teachers do is they have an area like this one you see over my left shoulder and they'll and they have it set up with a light and they will print a small size of that photo that they've been working on for their prize winner and they'll stick it on the wall and they'll look at it for a week two weeks three weeks and then he, over that period of time they decide oh i really like this photo and I want to invest more time in it. Or, you know, I don't like this photo after looking at it for two or three weeks, I'm not gonna waste any more time with it. Or they'll look at it and go, oh, I didn't notice this twig in the, in the back there that is really distracting me. When you have an image that you put on your monitor or your computer, you only see that image when you turn your computer on. How many of you turn it on every time you walk past the computer and look at that image? Well, guess what? If it's on the wall up here, you see it all the time. Now you have a chance to really look at it over a period of time and decide, is it worth my effort to do more or are there things in it that I could make better? So that's probably the, the one of the best things that any of us could do, regardless of whether you print for display or not, by having it on your wall and looking at it. Uh, I would encourage you um, to do that, okay? Um, we're gonna talk a little bit. On, are there any questions so far? <laughs> I've been kind of, no, of... not so far, David. Doing good. Okay. No questions. All right. Uh, so, um, printers and papers is another thing that I was going to talk about. 
I know a lot of you don't necessarily have your own printer. There are, uh, but that you can buy an, a, a somewhat inexpensive photographic uh, printer for around four or five hundred dollars. From and it seems like the leaders are Epson and Canon in the print arena. And for that price, you can print uh, up to a 13 by 19 size print, which is great. That's for a lot of people, that's all you need. Uh, you know, for people like uh, John on his bicycle, he needs much more because he makes these gigantic prints for his office. I don't know if you've ever been down to his, you know, body logic, but he has gigantic prints up. And so for that, you know, you might want to just have somebody do the print for you. But you can buy these photographic printers for not a whole bunch of money. And then you can make smaller prints for yourself. And if you really want to make a large print, then go down and have uh, a professional service do that for you. Um, small printers are, like I said, three, four, five hundred dollars, six hundred dollars. Large printers are two to four thousand um, dollars. I have a 44 inch wide printer looks like a piano and that's it's a lot of money but guess what the cost per print is a lot cheaper with a larger printer because you buy the little and and you buy these you have all have little printers and you buy the little cartridges and they want $20 for 10 milliliter cartridge well i can buy a 160 milliliter cartridge for $90 so that's 160 for 90 versus $30, $20 for 10 milliliters. And paper is also cheaper because you can buy it in rolls. And the, and the paper is also cheaper per uh, square foot. Uh, a lot of people ask, you know, what should I do as far as paper choices? Um, so let me go to, Let's see, I need to switch. Uh, hang on here. I need to switch to, oh, no, I just stay here. I need to go to screen share. Sorry, I'm <laughs> get, getting myself confused here. Uh, screen share, and I'm going to do go back to here. And now, you're looking at my document here, right? Okay, so uh, papers, and I, I apologize, they're kind of small. I should have, I can make, I can make this bigger. I can go, oops, no, that's just showing multiple pages. So David, yeah, can you make it page width and then make that full there screen? There we go. Yeah, yeah, keep going. Yeah, that's all better. right. All right, is that better? Yeah, it's better. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here is uh, a, one of my favorite photos that I like of my own photos, uh, a photo of Sandhill Cranes just after the fog in the morning has started to disappear. Uh, so when people go, well, what kind of paper should I use? Well, I, it depends on the print. I like this one because it has very soft light. It has this kind of uh, painterly-like quality of, of the image. So I don't want to print this on a glossy type of stock or something. I like to print this on a matte paper. And the matte papers have more what they call tooth. I don't know if you've ever heard that, that term. But the paper surface itself is has a you know has more of an organic feel. It's not this smooth, glossy type of surface. So that makes that type of a paper more suitable to this image. Uh, there was a um, there was an ophthalmologist uh, a couple of years ago that showed his work at Viewpoint in Sacramento, and he did. Uh, carbon, um, um, let's see, uh, black, direct carbon prints. 
And he did these very uh, sharp looking images from China of uh, fog and mountains and rock. And, and he did it on uh, Japanese uh, rice paper. And the images were just tremendous. You, you went and looked at them and you swear you could put your hand on the paper and feel the rocks. Because the paper and the printing and the, the image went hand in hand. So you can get, all, there are hundreds of different types of papers. And the differentiation is usually, are they photo black papers or are they matte black papers? And usually if you're doing an image like this on a, on a matte paper, then you're doing a matte black uh, image. And that is determined by the, um, my printer has both photo black ink and matte black ink. And I can, and I can tell it, I'm gonna use a matte paper uh, and that'll print out uh, on a matte paper with a matte black ink. Now, this image, can you see this one? Of the, of, this is one of my older images of this barn owl. This image would work well on a luster type of paper. And what's a luster type of paper? A luster paper is what's called an RC paper, a resin coated paper. Whereas a matte paper that we were talking about has no uh, coating on the papers at all. Uh, and they often don't have what's called optical brighteners. This image I print on a luster paper called Moab. Uh, um, and it's a coated paper, but why do I like this image on that? Well, because a luster or a photo black paper has deeper blacks. Uh, if you look back at, at this other one I, I showed you, it doesn't have a lot of sharp black detail, whereas this one has more of it. So I wanted that uh, that deeper black that I could find in a luster paper. And they have, luster papers have more what's called D-max. And what D-max is, is it, it's a deeper black. You can get deeper blacks with a luster type of paper. Uh, now, it's RC coated. If you were doing, going into, you know, some sort of a high-end art show, you know, you might find that you might like a non-coated paper. Now, if you have an image like this one, this is an Im this is the Louvre, and many of you know the the old and the new Louvre. This print would work well on a glossy paper because the glossy papers again are a photo black paper, and it has a lot of shine and elements to it that I might choose to do this on a glossy paper, a glossy or a luster paper. A lot of you, a lot of you know luster papers as satin papers. So um, making the choice of papers is really dependent on what the subject is, what the photo looks like. It's also dependent on um, how, where you're going to show it. Now, I'm not a big fan of metal prints, but a photo like this one would work very well uh, as a metal print. Whereas this one, I think I'm going to waste my money on a metal print. So a lot of people have gotten on the bandwagon of metal prints or the, you know, the coolest thing, but this would totally be wasted. You know, in fact, I don't think it would look good on the metal print, you know, because I don't want that shiny reflectivity. You now, think about it. Uh, there's also, uh, also um, acrylic prints. And, you, and many of you have seen acrylic prints. Now, if you took an image like this and put it on an acrylic print, 
it really pops. Acrylic prints are either printed on paper or they're printed on metal and they have an acrylic that's like a quarter inch, eighth of an inch on top of that. But that it's, a, it's an expensive process. If you go to Bay Photo and you ask them to do an acrylic print for you in this size, say 20 by 30, it'll cost you two to $300 to have them do an acrylic print. But guess what? Bay Photo doesn't do it. They have a place in Arizona that does it. Acrylic prints are, there aren't a lot of facilities that, that do that because it's a very elaborate process. But if you want something that you can, you know, that, that looks like it has a lot of depth to it and an image like this, you might choose to have somebody do it on acrylic prints. Um, okay. Um, so, let's see, where am I here? We talked about that, we talked about that. Okay. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how I, I don't know how many of you want to see how I do matting. Would that be something that would be of interest? So David, that would be great, but we do have a question that you might yes. want to respond to now. Okay. Um, Okay, if you had a black and white photo that had large deep black area, would you want to print that on luster or would that potentially make the black too overwhelming? I think it depends on the print, but black and white in itself, if it was a, if it was a soft black and white image, uh, I, I don't know that, uh, let's see, let me go to, let me see. I'm going to pull up an image and see if it helps. Uh, bear with me for a minute here. And let me see. Um, and I'm going to find. Um, let's see. It depends on the image. If it's black and white, just because it's black and white doesn't necessarily mean um, you, you would want to print it on a matte paper, but depending and uh, let's see, hang on, let me, Hang on for just a second. I'm going to look for something. Just give me a few seconds here. While I find something here. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Okay. Oops. Okay. If I was going to, oh, come on, come on. Okay. I hate these slow, I have a lot of these portable drives and they're so slow. Um, and okay, come on, come on. Any rate, um, I'm stumbling here because I'm waiting for the photo to come up. So, um, the short and and long and and easy uh, answer is it just depends on the image. If you have a very um, uh, sharp, detailed, very uh, uh, con contrasty type of black and white image, then yes, uh, 
you you may do that on a uh, luster type of paper, but if you have, let's say, an image like, okay, come on. I'm sorry, this is just, it's gonna, I'm, I'm gonna have to spend <laughs> more money here. Uh, okay, so let's see this image here. If I could move this image here. Can you see this image? Yes, the black and white one. Black I can. Black and white one. Yeah. Now this image, I think, would would work well on um, a matte type of paper. I mean, this one could work even on a luster paper, uh, but it has a lot of the you know soft light and whatnot. I might try this on a on a matte type of paper. I think that the feel of it, the, the mood of it, and everything fits uh, a matte paper very well. I don't know. Does that answer your who's ever question it was? And please what? unmute yourself if you'd like. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, that does. I mean, I was just, it's curious. It's, I guess it's always personal preference. I haven't tried a luster paper, but was just wondering because I have an image that has it's very high contrast with a lot of black. And I was like, I don't know if that'll be too much shiny black or if that would be good for it. So I don't know. Well, is it, you know, if, if, it's, if it's a deep black um, and the, the contrast, the high contrast is part of the beauty of the image, then yeah, maybe that would work well. Um, yeah, I might try it. I might try yeah, it. You might try that. Um, but I wouldn't shy away from luster or glossy papers just because uh, of the of the nature of them. Uh, here is a shot. Um, here, do you see this one? Uh, of the circles in the uh, yes. ceiling. Mm -hmm. oh, mm -hmm. oh, I didn't mean to do that. Go away. I didn't want you to start up Photoshop. Uh, Okay, so this image, you know, because of the of the the deep uh, uh, this black here, I would like it if the blacks were deeper, and this would be very hard to do and to show up well on on a matte paper, but on a luster paper, this image prints out very well. The blacks are very black, and I can make a lot of contrast. Uh, you know, this is a ceiling of the National Building Museum in the Washington D.C., and I just love the shapes and the roundness and the di and the dimensions of all of this. So this would work well on a luster paper. So David, here's another related comment from yeah. Janice, who says, "When I print black and white, I choose the paper based on the quality of the whites because a warm paper can yellow the whites." I usually okay. choose cool tone papers for black and white. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah, and Janice is, knows her stuff very well. And Janice's images are very painterly, painterly like uh, and organic, many of them. So that's another way to look at the choice of papers. There are, there you can buy, um, like if you like Hanamuli papers, or Epson's or whatever, you can buy uh, samplers from them for like 15 or $20. And it'll include most or many, if not most of all their papers. And then they'll come in eight by 10 sheets. And then you could print, you know, usually oftentimes they'll have, you know, two or three um, uh, uh, of each of the various paper types and you can print them and see how they look to you. I mean, that's one of the advantages of printing yourself because if you, if you go to Costco, they're not gonna have, you know, the Hanamuli German etching paper. They just won't have that. Um, also be aware that when you take your, and I don't know how many of you know this, if you're gonna take your prints and have somebody else print them, 
uh, you'll want to save it in, as an sRGB, um, uh, not, a, not an Adobe RGB file, because all the, the uh, printers that outside will look at an sRGB. Uh, what's the difference? Well, you have a smaller color gamut with a sRGB, but that's that that's something you should know if you take your your prints outside. So, David, uh, we have another related question here too, which fits in nicely. Yes. Is you mentioned the ICC profiles going back a little bit? How mm -hmm. do you integrate the ICC profile into a Costco print job? Well, because the what you do is you'll ask Costco if they have an ICC profile that they can give you. And Costco will tell you, will then know that they use an Epson or a Canon printer and they use whatever paper. And there, there will be an ICC profile for the, what Costco uses. So whether it's Costco or Bay Photo or whoever, you can ask, you can ask them um, to give you the that profile but they give it to you and then how what do you how do you use it oh you you take it and you install it in your uh in your library uh so that when you go to print if you're printing the say with photoshop when you uh go and and select that photo <coughs> it will um uh you'll have a selection there for uh uh, printer and paper, and you'll just choose the Costco ICC profile. And then it will uh, output correctly for Costco. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, other questions before I, I was gonna go over and- You're caught up, so. Okay, I was gonna go over and show you some uh, matting considerations, if you'd like. Do, do we have enough time for that? Yeah, you still have uh, over half an hour. You're till oh. 30, so you're good. All right, so I'm going to switch here to here, and I'm going to switch. Is it is it not working again? Huh. All right, let me try this. Something is going on over here. Uh, let me make a switch and let's see what's going on here. Okay, let's see. Okay, can you see this? Yes, I see that. Your map. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is my, hopefully this doesn't, I don't know. Oh. Did it go away again? Or is it still there? Yes. No, it went away again. Went away again. Eee. Um, let's see. I don't know if this is going to, hang on. Let me see what else I can do. This is here. This is here. This is here, if I pull this out of here and I put this, do you see it at all? No. Yeah, yes, now yes. I do. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So this is my mat cutter here. And, um, so there, David, can you move the hanging cable just to the off? In front oh, of the, the camera, cable? please. This one? Yeah, that's yeah. Great. Thank yeah. you. Okay. All right. So this is my mat cutter here, uh, and mats make a big difference to how a photo looks. I, and I, one of my students, I said I like mats with a little more room on them. If I take, um, if I take, let's say this image here and I and I mat it with I don't know if you can see that and I mat can you yeah, see that I can see that yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and now this is a fairly wide mat this is fairly wide for this image 
but it looks nice. And, it, and I never understood it till one of my students says, well, it gives it more breathing room. You know, I go, that's what it is. You know, and if I made this a little skinny mat, this image doesn't look as good on, on a skinny mat. So um, one of the advantages of doing this yourself rather than going down to Ben Franklin or something is you can buy an inexpensive mat cutter for oh, like $100. This is, this is about a $1,000 mat cutter, but you can buy them much less and do a, a little more work and make your own mats. And, how, and what I like to do with making my own mats, is if you go down to uh, Ben Franklin and you had Ben Franklin do a mat like this, you know, they'll charge you probably close to $20 to do just the mat for this print. Well, guess what? You can buy uh, mat, uh, you can buy mat paper, 32 by 40 inch. I can buy that for nine or $10. And I could make two, or if it's a little smaller, I could make three images, three mats, with that paper versus you know twenty dollars for one, and I can make it to fit. And one of the the things that I like is I always do my prints in standard frame sizes as much as possible. But because I make my own mats, even if the photo is an odd dimension, I can make the mat outside dimension fit a standard frame, and I can just pay the cost of a standard frame of 30 or $40 instead of spending 150, 200, $300 for a custom frame. So that's one of the joys of doing that. And uh, it's not hard to make, to make uh, mats. It's very simple. All you're going to do is you're going to decide on your print, this is an eight by 12 inch print. And I know if you look on the internet, you'll find standard frame sizes. You'll find, in fact, I have, you know, uh, taped on my uh, table here, I have taped all these things that tell me uh, for this size of a print, what are some standard frame sizes? And I know on this one for an eight by 12, for instance, an eight by 12, I can put it in a 14 by 18 mat, and that gives me three inches uh, around the edge. And all I have to do then is to take this mat cutter, I can make my backing and my, and my mat, and I don't know that, you, if you want, I'll show you how I do it, but it's not very hard, you know. Um, it only takes a, like a minute or two to make a mat for this. And then after I do that, I'll show you uh, how I mount them. Is there, does anybody need to see how I cut the mat? I'd, I'd be curious because yeah. I have the little you, bitty forty dollar one. So what would I get for getting a really yeah. nice? Okay, one? all right. Well, let's let's do that. If if you want to see that, I'm going to take this image here, and I'm going to make. And I decided that I want to put it in a fourteen by eighteen um, mat. So I'm going to take uh, a piece of mat board. Let's see, what size is this one? Uh, this one here is, okay, I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna just cut this. And all I have to do is 18. And the difference, Rachel, for you is, here's how easy it is. I come over here. I set this, I set this, here's my, here's my 18. I come over here, I set it to 
14, I have my dog assisting me here. Um, and I come over here and make my 14. And so now I have, all I'm going to do is the same thing with um, my front piece in the same, I'm just going to grab another sheet here. And this one is 14. And I come back. I could have done these all at the same time, save me a step here. Here's my 18. So here is a backboard and a, and a mat. And so I said, I wanted this to be three inches, but I add a little reveal on mine, which gives it a little bit of white space. So I go and I set these to three inches, less that white space reveal around the edge. I take my mat board and I, since I, the one thing that you get on this, Rachel, is I don't have to go and measure it. I just set the stops. I go and do this. I turn it around, I set it, and I do that. Turn this around over here. I reset this side here. Wow, and it cuts the corners nicely, a ball by itself, wow. Yeah, and so then I do that, and I do that, and voila, I have now. Wow, that's easier. I have that, and I have this, and I am ready to put it in here. Huh. There is finished nice it's, it's it's just that simple uh and then i'll come over for and you <laughs> that simple for you it takes me <laughs> a lot longer than that <laughs> well you know once you've done this for a while it's fairly simple and then i'll just show you how i mount the mats and put them together is the last step if you'd like to see that yeah do that yeah Okay, I'm going to switch camera views. Hang on. And let's see. All right. And now you see my other table here, right? Yes, we do. Okay. So what we do, and this is not a a perfect job but i'm going to take i do what's called an archival uh, mount so what i do is i take my mat board and i take my backing board and i'm just using this scrap piece here and i use two types of I don't know if you can see this. This is a linen uh, hinging tape. Um, and this, this is uh, made by Linco. And you'll take this tape and you will just peel off the backing of it. And you make your hinge now my whiny dogs i apologize liam no and i i butt these two ends together 
and that is forms my hinge. I take something to burnish the, the tape so that it sticks well. I take my image. Hopefully you can see all this. Yes, and we can see it, yeah. What's that? Yes, we can see it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you just take it and place it in your mat. I have, I have a little friend here. I have a couple of dogs. I have Liam here who whines, but I have another dog here who I don't have to feed or do anything. My friend, Joey. <laughs> Joey is a doorstop. He holds my, my print down so it doesn't move. And then I take another tape called from a company called Filmoplast. Filmoplast is a German manufacturer. I get that from a company in New York. Can you spell that please, David? Film. Film, Filmoplast, F-I-L M-O-P-L-A-S-T. Filmoplast, okay, thank you. Okay, and that tape is a, uh, is a different tape than the linen hinging tape because with this tape, once you get it, of course, when I do it not on camera, it comes off very easily, but because I'm doing this in a demo, I have the dickens of a time. Come on, separating, here we go. So I take this tape, you can't see it, but this side is sticky, this side is not. And so I put the sticky side underneath the print, half underneath, and half exposed. I take my linen hinging tape and I just, I'm not being, I don't need to be extremely precise. I just take and I, I cover usually about a third of the print or something like that. Then I take the linen hinging tape that I used to make the hinge before I put, this is a sticky side here. This is not sticky. I put that over this. And now this print is attached to the filmoplast tape, but the filmoplast tape, I can actually pull the print off of it without damaging the print. Now from there, so David, can I ask a question? Are you completely covering the filmoplast tape with the linen tape? Yes. So there's no yes. sticky remaining on the- There's no sticky. There is a little bit. I have just a little gap between the okay. photo itself and the hinging tape. So the only thing that holding the print on is the filmoplast tape with the sticky side facing this way the linen tape sticky side facing down. Now from there, I can just put this in the frame, it's done, but I do two other things. I take, uh, I have this ATG dispenser, which is a double-sided dispenser tape. And I run this here and I run it here and I run it here. I don't need to put it on top because I don't need to. And then I take it, my matte paper which is sitting around and I burnish this and I burnish that. I could also put corners on, which I do oftentimes, but that's belts and suspenders. So now this is ready to drop in to a ready-made frame. And you can see how easy that was to do. Any questions on that? 
Hang on. Yes, you do. Let's see. Come on. I'll stay okay. over. Oh, here. there's a question. What model mat color cutter were you using? Sorry. Oh, that's a Logan um, uh, platinum edge mat cutter. And and I have to tell you, I when they first came out with that one, Logan is not a it's a very popular hobbyist, you know, enthusiast brand of mat cutters and various things. I, I think I paid five or six hundred dollars for it. Now that's like a thousand dollars. But you can buy some if uh, if somebody wanted. I have a friend that has a, a C and H mat cutter that they're selling for, I think, two hundred and fifty dollars. It's uh, much like what I just showed you but uh, you know, for only 250, I don't know if they still have it, but it makes the process very easy because you don't have to measure for where you're making your cuts. So you saw all I did was adjust the stops to where the cuts were and zip, 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 there it goes. Other questions? I don't see any in the chat, no. Unless okay. you want to unmute and ask, please do so. Yeah, I'm going to go back to uh, the other uh, the other view here. And all right, and I'm going to come back to here. All right, that's. Pretty much it. Um, oh, I should, let me grab my sheet. Um, if you want to save some money, hang on, where did I put my sheet? My cheat sheet here, here it goes. So if you want to save some money, um, you can establish a, an account to buy some of your materials. For instance, uh, those of you that have gone down and bought glass at like Ben Franklin, it, they might charge you like say $16 for a medium sized piece of glass. At uh, Omega Molding, if you set up an account there, that same size piece of glass I pay less than $30 for 12 sheets of that glass, for instead of paying $16 for one sheet. And all I did was establish an account. I think Janice just established an account there. Rachel, you have an account there, right? Yes, I do. And all you need to have is a resale number. And the resale numbers, if you don't have one, as a photographer, if you ever sell anything, you're supposed to have a resale number uh, because you're supposed to collect sales tax on that. But having the resale number will allow you to buy from them and others um, uh, at those kind of prices. So I would encourage you to do something like uh, Omega Molding or whatever. And again, then I have another company, IT Supplies, that I buy a lot of my, my inks and various things from. If I order from them on Monday morning, Tuesday morning or Tuesday, uh, my ink comes in one day. Um, and there's no sales tax on it. They ship from uh, their warehouse in Nevada for their inks. Uh, so look at things like that. Um, you can save quite a bit by just going to a couple of different suppliers. Another supplier I like to use uh, is down in, in Folsom called the Frame Company. And you can buy uh, mats and, and frames from them for a, a, a not too expensive price. David, um, we, do, we do have a question for the handout you were look, showing us. Yes. Is it possible for you to send that to me? I could send it out. Sure. Sure. A lot I, of good info on that. All right. Um, that's it. You know, okay. if there, unless there's any other questions.
Um, I use oh, here's there is a question. Do you ever make your own frames? Actually, I do. <laughs> I, I am. I I just started. I used to buy uh, metal frames from um, uh, one of the large manufacturers, and I I was able to buy them at a wholesale price through a friend that had it. But that that's no longer available to me. So now I buy lengths of of, uh, of wood frames from Omega. Uh, and I have a chop saw, a, a miter saw. I cut the, the, the frames and I join the, I join the frames and I make my own entire wood frames. Now huh. I also have a table saw. I can actually go and buy and get any wood and I can, you know, make the different shapes and cut them and join them and it's not a very hard process at all and if you wanted to do that you, it, it's something you can come over and I can show you how I do it and you can see if you want to, if you want to go down that road but it's kind of fun you know because you can take some old wood and and you can take anything and you just make the proper you know 45 degree, degree cuts and I use um uh, wood glue to join it and then I have what's called a v-nailer and so I have a little inexpensive $80 v-nailer that will uh, it, you put the pieces together and and they're glued and the v-nails hold it and then and you make you can make your wood frame out of barn wood any kind of wood you want oh. it's kind